crying out to you, Father, that we need you. We desire you. You are our everything. In your son's name we pray. Amen. We believe in his power. We know that he can do all things and that with him we can do all things. I wonder this morning if you'd be just willing to admit a couple of things and acknowledge before God. If, and I'm just going to ask you to do something. Uh, if, you, if you have need of prayer, I don't know what it might be about. I don't know what's, what all is going on. If you'd be willing just to admit, Lord, I just I need you to meet a need in my life, would you just stand and just acknowledge to him um, of that? I'm just telling you, I'm standing. I just want to ask the Lord to meet this need. He knows what's going on. And as we stand together, uh, let, me, let me pray over us, all right? Father God, in your matchless name, we have sung about your amazing love, your amazing grace, uh, that Father you are with us in the midst of, of the stuff that is going on in our life. Father we have just cried out the fact that, that the name of your son is the most wonderful, powerful, matchless name that there is. And Father as we stand in acknowledgement today of need in our life, Father of, of concerns that we have, of, of, of life that is happening to us, Father, we come in agreement, Lord, believing that you can meet those needs in our life. That, Father, you have the answer. You are already working in those circumstances and situations. And so, Father, if we need to today, maybe this standing is, is, is we're just we're laying it at your feet once again. Because it's something that we take back up from time to time and try to carry on our own. And today is a fresh acknowledgement that we lay it at your feet and we ask you to meet that need in our life. Father, we thank you and we praise you for the power and the privilege of prayer, believing that you can meet these needs. In Christ's name I pray, amen. All right, you can be seated. Some of y'all are saying, whew, I survived that one. I wonder... If God's done anything in your life in the last week, I'll give you a week, all right, that's been a blessing or a praise, that if you were to be given, I'm not going to make you share, all right, but if you were given the opportunity, you'd have something to praise the Lord about because of what He's done in the last week. Stand. Stand up, man. Let's stand. Can anybody just not stand it? Do they need to shout it out? Anybody need to brag on the Lord I'll tell you what we're standing because God's done something in our life right we're going to come in contact with somebody either through the remainder of this day or tomorrow or the next day I believe not in, a, in, a, in any sense of, of anything to bring attention to ourselves I believe one of the greatest things we could do for the Lord is to take the time to tell somebody what God did for us that we're standing for today and, and share that with them. It'll be a blessing to them and, and it'll, it'll give testimony to the Lord Jesus Christ. That we're pausing in a moment just to say, Lord, you did something for us. I don't even understand why or whatever it may be, but here's what it is. And I just want to give him praise and I want to share that with you. You may have an opportunity to do it before you leave church this morning. Tonight, you're going to encounter somebody and the Lord's just going to impress you. Man, the pastor had me stand. I acknowledge that God did something in my life this week. I need to share that. He didn't just do it for our benefit. He did it so that we could glorify His name and give Him some praise and glory. So just because we're standing and, and we're acknowledging, let's just give the Lord a hand this morning for what He's done this week. All right, and you can be seated. You probably don't need to open your Bibles to this particular passage of Scripture, but I'm going to ask you to do so anyway. Matthew chapter 28. Reference this last week. 
And I began giving you um, an alphabet of things and of, of, of things that ought to be true in our lives, characteristics and traits that ought to be true in our lives. If we're, uh, what we're going to use, what I'm using the phrase on mission uh, for the Lord. And, uh, and so I want to just refresh just a moment that one of the key statements that we have as a church family is that we are here to make disciples that make disciples. That, that we have a commitment to the Lord to make disciples that make disciples. Our commitment is based upon His commandment. When He tells us in Matthew chapter 28 to go into all the world and make disciples. Yeah, it's as you're going. The, sometimes we get so focused on the go that we forget what we're to be going about. And, and the going is as I go through my day. So when you encounter somebody, you can, you can share with them what God's been doing in your life. And in that process, what you're doing is you are in the process of making a disciple. No. Making a disciple means I have to take this person that's accepted Christ and then I, I sit down with them and I read and I, and I study and I teach them how to pray and I do this. No. Discipling starts before the person ever comes to Christ. I think we miss that sometimes. That in the building of the relationship with somebody, I am already discipling them. What am I? I'm discipling them to Christ. I'm letting them see in me that there is something different. Remember, not better, but different. And the difference in me is Christ, and I want them to know that Christ. Now, the sole purpose in my building a relationship with them is not just to see them come to know the Lord so that then I can drop them and go try to win somebody else to the Lord, right? We've done that too long as Baptists, I'm sorry, but that's, that's sometimes why we're in the condition we are in churches today, because we just try to see people come to know the Lord, and we think our job's done. But that's really where the work continues, because we're, we're not just to move them from being lost to being saved, but we move them from being saved to being in ministry, connected to the body life of the church, learning and growing so we continue developing that relationship with them and I see them come to faith in Christ and then we introduce them to other believers if we haven't already done that and in that context we begin to nurture and equip and establish those folks and give them roots and, and a foundation to stand upon and so we we move them from lost to saved and we continue to walk with them and and the process continues to where we see them involved in ministry and they're, 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 they're not just sitting in a, in a church pew, but they're, they're serving within the body life of the church. They're using how God has gifted them and made them in the body life of the church. They're, they're helping and encouraging and ministering to other people. And so they're involved in ministry. And then last week I, I added one to us, right? Because that's where I'd always stopped with my little illustration. We're lost to saved in ministry. Praise God, we've done it. But part of that in ministry is then equipping them that they would go out and begin a relationship with somebody that's not a Christian and have friends and minister to those folks so that they could see that lost person come to know Christ and that they could help that lost person get plugged into the local church and into the body of other believers and growing in their faith. And then that person would then go out and be on mission. So we're lost to saved. We understand those two terms, right? Lost is not I'm, I'm wandering out here and I need to stop and ask directions to get to wherever you're going to go eat today, all right? It's, not, it's, it's lost, meaning without a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Destined for hell without intervention. And, the, and then when we get persons saved, it's not that we, we, we pulled them out of water, we are rescuing them, but we're not doing the rescuing, Christ is. But a saved person, that terminology is, that person now has a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. They have asked Christ to forgive them of their sins, to come into their life, and to be their personal Lord and Savior. To be their coach, to be their boss, to be their leader. Whatever the term is that you need to use, that's, that's what that means. Lost, saved. In ministry is realizing the connection. He says, go and make disciples and baptize them. 
The baptism is a, what we look at is a step of obedience for us as believers. That's what we would lead people to do. But the baptism is, is an association. When I choose to be baptized in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, then I am acknowledging that I am a part of the family of God. I'm acknowledging to Him, to myself, and to anybody else that's around to see that. And so we're, we're drawing them into and acknowledging the fact when they're in ministry that they are a part of God's family and that there are things that they can do because God's gifted them in ways that they can serve and that they can minister and that they can make a difference. And so we, we move them into that in ministry and then this on mission is when we take what God has done for us and in us and through us and we take that and we share that with someone else. So it's, it's like when we go to Canada on a mission trip, all right? But it's not just when we go to Canada on a mission trip. It's not just when we send a group of students to Colorado as we did last summer. It's not just when we've helped plant a church in Acapulco. It's not when we go out and, and away from here. It is that. But it's when you and I choose, when we get on mission, it's when you and I choose to take what God has done for us and not only invest in the lives of the people that we associate with through the body life of the church, but we then take that message and we go out and we try to impact our world with the gospel. What's our world? It's our workplace. It's our organizations. It's our relatives. It's those that we live nearby. And it's our daily contacts. That's our world. That's, that's the world that God's placed. And we take that message of the gospel and we go on mission and we take that message to try to impact other people's lives with the message that changed our life. And so how do we become these on-mission Christians? That's, that's how do we be this person that goes and makes disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded them with the promise that, lo, I am with you always, even to the ends of the earth. So I continue to invest. How do I do that? What needs to be true in my life? And that's where I gave you or began my list of ABCs, and I'm going to run through them because my challenge to you was my ABCs are not the only ABCs that are out there. God could impress upon you other words that would fit you and your thoughts as well. But here's my, and so I challenge you to make your own list of ABCs of what it would look like for you to be on mission. Now, many of my words, I've got scriptures that go along with them, and I trust you would too. I'm running through these because I want to get to the second half of the sermon that I didn't get to last week. All right? A, be available. B, be bold. C, compassionate. D, different. That's as far as we got last week, right? E is energetic. It's going to take energy. Flexible. Be flexible. I think of Philip who was preaching and having a great success where he was and God said, hey, I want you to go over here and, and minister to this Ethiopian dude. And he just, he was flexible enough to sit there and say, I'll go where you want me to go and do what you want me to do. Genuine. Maybe giving or genuine. Some of these I couldn't settle on one word. Humble. Helpful. Inviting. Joyful. Kind. Loving. Motivating. Nice. Obedient. Positive. Positive quick to respond, respectful, selfless, teachable, usable, vulnerable, wise. Man, X will stop us all on it. I tried to use excellent, but, but you know, the symbol for Christ from the Greek letter chi is the letter X. So I wrote X down on my piece of paper for the alphabet there to remind me that I'm time to be Christ to the world. I'm not a guy that likes to use Xmas. I just, I don't like that because, but I understand that it stands for Christ. And so my X is, I want to be X, I want to be Christ to the world. My Y is yourself, be yourself. Folks will see right through you. That's why genuine was my G as well. Be zealous. Never losing the fervor that you have for what Christ has done for you. ABCs of being on mission with God. 
And so there are lots of different words and lots of different things we could talk about. But I really believe for these things to become true in our life, for us to be an individual, for us to become and continue to grow into the church that God wants us to become, to really live out and to truly have a commitment to make disciples that make disciples, to truly do that, to truly be motivated to make disciples because of our love for God and our love for others, the greatest commandment in the second one. I mean, for us, for us to truly do that, I think something has to happen right here. I think that there has got to be a shift in our thinking in order for our actions to follow. Because for some of us, we get in the, in, the, in the situation that, well, somebody else will reach the world with the gospel. Somebody else will do it. We think, the other thing that we might think is we've got all the time in the world to fill these seats that are empty. We, we might get to thinking all sorts of thoughts, and the world will infiltrate our thoughts, and the world will say, hey, all you've got to do is look out for you. Everybody else take care of themselves. If we're not careful, we'll let the world's thought. That's why why Paul said in Romans chapter 12 that that we would renew our minds, that we would would transform ourselves by the renewing of our minds, that we would would not let the world influence us. And trust me, they are trying to. Think of your favorite commercials. Think of your favorite television shows. Those things are trying to refabricate and change the morals of our world. They're trying to teach us things that this book doesn't teach us. They're trying to motivate us to do things or not to do things in terms of the gospel. So what needs to change up here so that I become available, so that I become bold, with my message what needs to change up here so that I so that I become compassionate what needs to happen up here so that I that I am different and I'm and I'm flexible and and genuine what what needs to happen you say well preacher aren't you missing it from right doesn't it have to have to happen right here yeah but as we get things straight up here It'll filter down through our heart and it'll take that head knowledge that all of us have. We know that God wants us to be on mission. We know that God wants us to make a difference in the world in which we live. We even know what His Word says about what we should be doing. So something's got to give. Acts chapter 17. Look to that passage for just a second. Paul and Silas in Thessalonica. I probably like this passage because it uses my name in it. Paul had gone in, as his custom was, in verse 2 it says, on three different Sabbath days, and had reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and proving that it was necessary for Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead, saying, This Jesus whom I proclaim to you is the Christ. Some were persuaded, joined Paul and Silas, as did a great number of many devout Greeks and not a few of the leading women. But the Jews, there was a group that was jealous and taking some wicked men of rabble, they formed a mob and set the city in an uproar and attacked the house of Jason, seeking to bring them out to the crowd. And when they could not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the brothers before the city authorities, shouting, These men, listen, this is the verse that I want you to see, These men who have turned the world upside down have come here also. And this fellow, Jason, has received them into his house and They're all acting against the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king named Jesus. And the people in the city authorities were disturbed when they heard these things, and when they had taken money as security from Jason and the rest, they let them go. 
What's the testimony in the midst of all of these folks that are so upset and, and trying to, to come at them? They're saying these folks that are taking a message and they're changing the world, they're turning the world upside down. Something had happened to them. This Paul and this Silas and these folks that were traveling the world, something had happened that motivated them to move and do something for the Lord, to become on mission. Four quick thoughts this morning. The first is, a person that's on mission for the Lord, the thinking that's going to change is it's going to shift from being selfish to godly. I'm going to have a, a God focus on everything. When I went on a mission trip to uh, Mexico, one of the trips that we took uh, several years ago was we were doing eye exams. And, and so we took... Uh, glasses and all to give to the to give to the kids and the parents and all of them once we did the eye exams. Now you know I'm not trained. I can't give an eye exam, but but Dr. Irby and and Mark Olney, two guys that went with us, uh, they went. What I was trained to do was when they gave me the prescription that they found, I was trained to go and look through all these boxes and find out of these hundreds of glasses and see which prescription we could find that was close enough as close as possible to theirs. So it's high training right there, task I could do, right? And uh, they found something that I was able to do, working with numbers and finding pluses and minuses. And I didn't have to know what all that meant. I just needed to know what to find, right? But here's how we gave the test. There was one word. You guys know eye exams, right? You got big letter up here and they get smaller and all that. One word. Dios. That's God. In case you didn't know. And every eye exam, I'd hear Dr. Irby, or I'd hear Mark, say, just focus on God. Focus on Dios. And as they would, they would do their exam and give them the prescription that they needed in order for them to be able to focus more clearly in life. Something simple about that. But something very difficult. Because our thinking has to shift from what the world says. The world says, look out for yourself and just do what you want to do and don't care about others. His word says, focus on me. I will open the world up to you. And so what, what needs to change about your, your thinking and even your, your sight? And Could it just be a simple message of don't be self-centered, but be God-centered. Focus on Dios. So maybe... That's a thought process that needs to change for us. Changing our thinking from there. Maybe for some of us, we have to change our thinking from thinking about inside to outside. We gotta, we gotta shift our thinking of we gotta everything we gotta do has gotta be for for us and for what's happening inside here and and what we've gotta do and. Maybe, maybe our thinking needs to get a little broader and we need to think outside to the folks that are around us. Maybe for some of us we're okay thinking about local things and, man, doing this teacher thing tonight and the school appreciation, that's, that's okay. But, man, I just don't understand why you'd want to take a group of us to Mexico or to Canada or to Colorado or to wherever God may lead us to go. I just don't get that, that extending the borders thing. I just don't... We send missionaries to go. We pay... We pay for missionaries to go there through our offering and through all of this, yeah. I don't know where you are in the thinking process of where it would be that mission happens. But mission will happen when we take our mind off of ourself and our thoughts off of ourself and we focus on God. Mission will happen when we think that there's more to life than what happens right in here and when we get out there. Mission will happen when we take what we're doing out there and we take it even further. Or we take what we do when we go further and we
we bring it back to do it here. I didn't, I didn't make up the word, but I'm going to give you the word. It's glocal. We don't, need, we don't only need to think about doing things globally and taking on mission to be going out and far away from here, but it's also doing things locally. It's doing things outside of the church walls. It's taking the message. Acts 1.8 says, You'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. Right here, out there, out there, out there, and out there. So it's not just some of us will need to include a shift in our thinking from not just what happens and the needs that are inside the church, but also outside the church. And I'll just, I'll just brag on you. I believe, I believe that there's a, seven years later, there's a much larger heart for the outside than there was seven years ago. And you spend two years holding things together and going through what, and that transition and all of that, it is very common and very natural for a church to turn inward focused. But from almost day one, some of us are still struggling. It's all right. But from almost day one, folks were on board with saying, hey, we don't just need to be inward focused. We must also be outward focused. That's, that's a picture of a thinking change that takes place that in order to be on mission, it's not just what's best for me and what I need. It's what God wants. It's not just what we need to take care of in here, but it's also the fact that the world out there needs the gospel. And however we might do that as a church, from an appreciation dinner to a Christmas shop to a serve Glenpool day, to walk in your neighborhood, to pray in for your neighborhood, whatever it might look like. Those are the thought changes. Those thought changes lead to action changes, right? When I change my thinking and I focus on the Lord and I, and I realize that, that it's more than just being inside, it's about being outside. Brother Steve mentioned it in his message three weeks ago. It's about finding where God is active and joining Him there. That, that's, that's the principle. And so it's not, it's not either or. It's not we've got to be inside or outside. It's both and. God's doing things in the body life. He's doing those. But He's also working out there. And so we participate. But for some of us, it's a change in the way that we think and we picture life. The third thought, I think I told you four, I actually have five, but uh, that's all right, isn't it? The third one is move from thinking about only the right now, think about the forever. The temporal versus the eternal. Sometimes our thinking is so focused on what's going on right now and what is happening right now that we miss the fact that what we're doing is we're investing in something that's going to last forever. And so what are you living for? Are we just living for right now? What are you investing in? I don't know what God's plans are for my life and for this church, but I'll just use this illustration. What God has planned for this church is going to live well beyond the life of this pastor. I'm investing now, but at the same time, I'm investing now because there's eternity that's coming. And I realize that there will be things that... that Y'all don't want me to talk about this church? We'll talk about one of the other ones, all right? There are things that God is doing through the churches where God's allowed me to serve and just a small snippet of my life and my family's life that was invested there. There are things that we, we didn't just invest for then. We invested for the future. We invested for, for eternity so that those 
churches that had not even looked outside the walls of their church or their little community to do anything that are now taking mission trips and they're, they're going places and doing things that they never dreamt of before. That's, that's, that's not the, the now thinking, that's the eternal thinking. That's investing now my life in, into people and into lives so that eternity is changed. That's, that's why we, we set up a will in our family. Right now there's a whole lot of bills associated with that will. That's what we're going to leave the kids, right? But, but there's another piece of that, 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 that I leave a portion of whatever my estate might be to a local church and through that, that, that is, that is a, that's a, I'm going to just live now and spend all that now and do all of that now. Or I can think eternal views. And I could set aside a portion of that that would live on well beyond my years. So that in the years to come, after I'm dead and gone, there are still lives being impacted with the gospel. We, have a late, we had a lady, I never got to meet her. She was a part of Holdenville First Baptist Church. Her last name was Bowden. And when she passed away, she left $50,000 to the church through the Baptist Foundation. And, and there was $50,000. And they, the church set up a Bible Bowden fund that provided Bibles for all new believers, ministries around the, 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 the United States. They could send letters of request to the church, and the church would use the proceeds, the interest off of that investment and they would buy Bibles to supply I don't know how many Bibles I was a privilege to be able to take to a prison and give to the prison chaplain because they'd call and request Bibles for their new believers I don't know how many Bibles we sent to this church up in Idaho that was planting or this church over in Illinois that was doing this or this church down in Arizona or this church because somebody looked beyond the temporal and looked to the eternal and they said, what can I do now that will make a difference for eternity? So what can you do? What are you investing in? Give me 10 minutes to look at your checkbook and your calendar. You don't have to worry about me looking at it. God sees it. God knows what we're investing in. God knows if our pictures are temporal or eternal. But it's a change in our thinking. What can I do to make a difference in eternity? I've got to shift my thinking from security to service. From security to service. Oh, safe. Man, it's safe to sit right here in this pew. And I'll tell you, the front ones are way more comfortable than the ones y'all are in. They're newer, all right? The padding's better shape and all. Y'all think those are broken. Y'all ought to come try these right up here at the front. They're pretty good. But we're secure. And we get locked into what is secure and what feels safe. And that security and that safety will keep us from going out and turning our world upside down. You want to talk to Paul about security? Safety. Beaten. Jailed. Cursed. You name it. But no, it was about serving. These folks were after them. Looking for them. These guys are making a mockery of things. No. They're willing to get out of the boat. They're willing to get out of that security. we got to... We gotta, we gotta overcome that thought. Jesus said something like this in Matthew 8. He said, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man doesn't have any place to lay his head. He wasn't, he wasn't worried about security. He was out there serving. I'm not sure if this who said this. I know that I didn't come up with it, but I don't have down in my notes who said it. We cannot stay where we are and go with God. God is always at work. God is always on the move. Some of the places He sends us to go will be very cushy. They'll be very receptive. They'll be very warming. 
open. Other things He'll call us to do will be more difficult, but what we can't get caught up in is whether it's safe or not safe. We have to be obedient and we have to be willing to serve. And so I can't let my thinking overcome and I've got to stay safe and I've got to watch over this and I've got to watch over that and there's part of it that scares me as I think about it, but the times back when we dedicated our kids to the Lord and we said, Lord, thank you for blessing us with them, but they are yours. Use them however you see fit. That's so easy to roll off my tongue and to say and to be a part of. But I still yet don't know exactly what that means. And I don't know where I might go visit my family in the years to come. But what I do know is that wherever they are, the Lord is with them. And that I trust with all of my heart that wherever they will be will be right in the center of God's will for their life and there's no better place I would rather them be than in the center of God's will. If that means surrendering security to be faithful to serve, then that's the shift in thinking that has to take place to be an on-mission Christian for the Lord. Maybe the plus side of that is who knows what parts of the world the Lord will let me travel to, right? And the sights that I may get to see because of the obedience of my family. The last is really right along with that, that I would shift my thinking from comfort to sacrifice. And that really may just be the same way of saying the one I said before. From comfort to sacrifice. You know, the person that I thought of was a guy by the name of Kyle. Kyle was our uh, kind of connect person at Hope Mission uh, when we did the soccer camp a couple of weeks ago. And there were several things that he said that were just kind of shattering in, in some ways. But one of the things that he said, he was sitting there just talking to us, and he said, I could go a lot of places and make a lot more money. But he said, there's no place I'd rather be than making a minimum wage, investing in the lives of these kids on a day-to-day -day basis. Because it's where God wants me to be comfort sacrifice where does that one come in well if I'm thinking of myself I'm going to go take the job that pays a little more because it's going to let me live a little more comfortably God may have that for you I you'll determine those things this guy he knew he was better off making what he was making doing what God was telling him to do at that moment and if that meant waiting till he got to, to the place to eat so that they would feed him for the day, that's what he'd do. Y'all remember how far he said he, he went every day? He had an hour and a half, I think, to work every day. To sacrifice comfort for service. To do what God's leading you to do. That's the shift of thinking that has to take place. Place. And I believe if we do, David's words, or what was said of David, is repeated in Acts chapter 13, and it says this For David, after he had served the purpose of God in his own generation, fell asleep. He had served his purpose, he had lived on mission. Had he made mistakes? Yes. We'll all make some mistakes along the way. He was faithful. Paul and Silas and many others like them, faithful. What did those folks do? They turned the world upside down. What did they let happen? They let a change of thinking lead to a change in the way that they lived. So I just ask you this morning, I know somewhere down in there we want to be on mission for God. We want to take the steps to move somebody from lost to saved to in ministry to on mission. We want, to, we want to be out there advancing the kingdom of God. So what needs to change in your life? Is it, is it one of those thoughts? Is it I'm just happy being right here, doing only what happens right in here, and I could care less about what happens out there? Is that, is that you? God needs to change. It does need to change our heart. I mean, that's really what needs to change.
if that's what you're thinking, ask God to change your heart so that it'll lead to a change in action. Am I more concerned about what's going to happen to me or what could happen for the Lord? Am I more concerned about my own security and safety or am I more concerned about being obedient and serving the Lord? What's going on and what needs to change so that we can make a difference with the days that we have left? Why don't you stand with me? Maybe you're here today and you'd say, I don't know what any of that means or what you just said, preacher, but there was something you said a moment ago when you were describing what it meant to be lost and what it meant to be saved, and I can tell you that I am still lost and I have never been saved. Can I tell you you got the most important part of the message if that's where you're at today? And if you would acknowledge that before Him, He is willing to forgive you of your sins and to come into your life. So if you're here today and you've never trusted Christ, and you're still waging that war and trying to, to do things your way, once you come and just surrender to Him today, I'd love to visit with you or have someone visit with you about what that looks like for you. Once you come and make that decision. And if you're here and you've made that decision, what's keeping you from being fully on mission for the Lord? Making a difference for His kingdom with your life. And deal with that right now.